The following program was originally broadcasted in November 2016. Your Humanities Half Hour is brought to you by the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. Hafidades and Perro, welcome to Your Humanities Half Hour. I'm Catherine Perry, and it's my pleasure to have in studio a very special young lady from the Marshall Islands. Her name may be familiar to you, Kathy Jetno Kitchener. Kathy, welcome back to Saipan, and welcome to Your Humanities Half Hour. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be back. Yeah. Well, a lot of people probably recognize your name for that stunning performance at the United Nations Climate Leaders Summit in New York City in 2014. is all across YouTube. I understand it moved many people to tears. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about that. Um, well, uh, when I, I got nominated for that position, uh, the civil society speaker, when I moved back home to the Marshall Islands. So I had just had my daughter. I had just completed my master's at uh, University of Hawaii. And I returned home to begin teaching at the College of the Marshall Islands when the ambassador, the U.S. ambassador to the Marshalls, called me and uh, asked if he'd be, I'd be okay with being nominated for the position. The thing is, I didn't know at all what it was. I didn't know that it was a, what kind of um, event it was or anything like that. So I just said, okay, sure. And then I got an email saying, you know, that out of 500 nominations, they had narrowed it down to 50, and I was one of them, and could I send a video? So I did that. And then I got a phone call a few days later, and they were basically saying, okay, you are definitely having a speaking role. You're one of four opening uh, people who are speaking. And then a few days later, I got another call saying, okay, you're the one opening in front of 150 world leaders, and you're following Leonardo DiCaprio, and it was just crazy. It was a crazy, crazy whirlwind of uh, performance, yeah. How did that make you feel when you got that email? Uh, terrified. <laughs> well, when I got the email, the email was first just like, oh, this is much more competition competitive than I realized I didn't know what it was you know I didn't know that it was for the opening yeah and so um yeah but when I got the phone call that was when I, got, I was just extremely terrifying <laughs> yeah. did you have an idea of what you were going to say when um before that you got that phone call or did that uh, the idea of this poem come to you after well, initially, the position of civil society speaker was only supposed to speak for, I think, about like something short, like three minutes, and or maybe four to five minutes. And um, once the organizers noticed, realized that I was a spoken word artist, and they saw my past videos of me performing poetry on climate change, they asked me to write a completely new piece that would be accompanied by a video. Originally, what they had planned was someone would create a video of images of climate change and effects and have Leonardo DiCaprio speak over it. But since I was a poet, they asked me to write a completely new piece, which is a tall order. If you're a poet, you know that writing a piece within two weeks for a world leader for a conference. Two weeks. Yeah, yeah less than two weeks, in fact. It was less than two weeks. And, you know, I was staying up all night breastfeeding. I was, like, teaching for the first time. It was just a crazy... Uh, I was basically in a panic. Yeah, <laughs> but the the results was were stunning. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess that's what happens when you're in a panic. Is sometimes when you're down to the wire, you dig deep and you find something. For me, what helped was that um, the you. I asked the organizers. I said, they said, you know, we need you to write a poem that would save the world. You know, quote. And I was like, oh, I don't know how oh, to do small, that. Oh, small order. <laughs> yeah, it's small order exactly. Um, so I asked them, okay, I don't know anything about the climate movement, you know, and they wanted me to speak to the climate movement. So I said, could you just send me as many images and videos as you can? And that's what they did. They sent me a Google Drive, and I just went through it all, and what I saw really moved me. It was this so many people fighting for climate change that I had no idea were doing so. You know, like I thought I only knew of what we were doing in our part of the world, but I had no idea that throughout the entire world there were these people fighting. So I thought, well, I don't know how to write to world leaders, and I don't know how to write to a movement. But, you know, I just had my daughter. You know, she was seven months old at the time. And I thought, you know, if I w if she was to grow up, I would want her to know about this, the fact that there's so many people fighting for our island, for her, for the next generation. And so that's where the poem really came out of, was this idea of me writing this letter to my daughter of what I want her to know about this fight. Yeah. 
since you gave that, uh, delivered that poem in 2014, has your life changed? Yes, significantly so. Yeah. Um, suddenly, I kind of have like this foot in the door into the this international arena of discussion and uh, and talking, you know, this this dialogue on climate change that I didn't have before. I had like a toe in the door with this one poem I wrote called Tell Them that was also on YouTube. But this just opened up so many more doors. And um, I have this platform. And I remember one of my friends kind of teasing me. He said, uh, he was just like, yeah, for some reason, people are listening to you. So you might as well, you know, use it. And that's kind of what it is. It's like, I don't know why people are listening to me, but they are. So I'm just trying to use the platform while I have it to raise awareness on this issue that is very close to my heart and I think that is very urgent and real. Well, we'll talk a little bit later about your nonprofit organization mm. that you you have in the Marshall Islands, but what are some of the significant things that this opportunity has opened up for you, you feel? Um, well, significant. I think now I'm getting more opportunities to share my story abroad, like outside of the Marshall Islands. So Saipan, you know, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that performance, you know, um, like being here in Saipan. And then I, I'm also I began to I've been performing at the COP last ma last year. I performed at the COP 21. So COP is the conference of the parties, which is a conference on climate change for the entire world, where the entire world comes together to discuss climate change every year. Last year was a really big, big one um, in Paris, where they were working out the first climate treaty, you know, that the world would have to sign on to, you know, save our world. And um, I was there performing poetry as well. So in a sense, it's really kind of given me, again, this place where I can speak from and perform my writing uh, and share these stories of our experiences with the rest of the world. There are a number of our listeners who are probably at least familiar with the Marshall Islands, probably mm -hmm. know where it is. But take us there now and describe what life is like there. Mm. I would say it's not so different from here in the sense that it's slow, it's kind of comfortable. Um, well, to me, I'm very comfortable there, obviously, and I feel very comfortable here, too. It's just, you know, an oh, islander. Thank you. We'll take that as yeah, a compliment. Yeah, it is. Thank it you. is definitely a very good compliment. I um, It's, you know, it's comfortable and people know one another. And um, the big difference between Saipan and here and there is that there are no mountains. It's completely flat. And there are certain, and, you know, I heard there's like three roads or something or four main roads, three or four main roads. For us, we only have one main road. And on cer in certain areas of the island, it's so flat and so thin that you can see ocean on either side of you. And so that's how vulnerable we are. And climate change to us washes up to our shore, and it's something that hits us across the face so much more immediately than how it might be affecting your people. Yeah. Um, thinking back to your childhood, which actually was not that long ago, uh, <laughs> what, how do you see things have changed since when you were a child growing up? Well, to be, well, first, I need to be clear is um, I was born in the Marshall Islands and I grew up until I was six years old in the Marshalls, but I moved actually away to Hawaii and then moved back to uh, the Marshall Islands after I completed college. So the changes that I've noticed in climate change isn't necessarily the changes that I've seen, pers you know, I've seen from growing up there. It's from the observations of my elders. And so it was talking to my mom, talking to the elders around me, you know, asking them about the flooding that's been happening more recently. So flooding, so what's been occurring is because of how low our island is, yeah, uh, any time that there is a simple high tide, you know, mixed in with uh, wind force or a storm nearby or any of those elements, it results in a massive flooding where homes, you know, get destroyed, uh, graves get washed out into sea, um, crops get dried up. And then besides the flooding, there's also, you know, a lot of drought. We've had just had our worst drought. So those issues, those cases of flooding, it's called king, and it usually happens during a season called, we call king tide season. Those are happening much more frequently than ever before. And again, it was those elders who told me they'd never seen anything like this in their lifetime. Um, in fact, just last week, we had another flooding. Like just last week, I just came back home from Oregon after doing a trip on climate change and uh, photos surfaced up on Facebook from some Marshallese showing an island nearby was flooded once again. So it's, it's very common at this point. And this isn't something that we've ever seen before. 
how is it affecting the people um, either their their habits are there are there people leaving because this is such a problem or are the people do you feel I mean is this the main thing on their mind how much of an impact is climate change having on the people of the Marshalls well I you know I want to be like realistic I, the thing is like climate change yeah it, it's definitely on our minds and people understand what it is because it, it happens so much we know why there's flooding and we know that it has to do with climate change Um, But people aren't moving yet. You know, this is their home. And many of them will never move because that's their land. That's their island. Um, People are moving because, you know, because of the many reasons that people move. Because they want more job, a different job. Because they want to go to school. Because they want to visit family for health reasons. Um, But no, not many people. I think I have heard like one or two isolated incidences. Like not many people are moving because of climate change. I think... We're very. St- I'm starting to think we're very stubborn people. We're definitely rooted. Strong will. That's yeah. a complementary yeah, term. Strong will. Yeah. <laughs> Which I think is true uh, for people living in this kind of situation. You mentioned this first poem you had, mm-hmm. and I'm curious to know at what point in your life, like climate change, really became so important to you. Well, it was. It's actually pretty new. That's another thing, you know. Like that's why it's actually interesting for me to have this platform to speak on this issue because I'm I'm new to the game, relatively, you know. Um, I didn't really begin to understand the impact of climate change until I moved back home to the Marshall Islands after I completed my college degree in California. And the thing is, I'd been away for about like 16 years, and so when I moved back home and was living there, not just visiting, but actually living there. Uh, that's when I came to face the reality of how vulnerable we are because the ocean out there is just huge. I mean, there's just no way around it. I mean, you guys have the mountains, and I feel like that kind of maybe distracts a bit from how enormous the ocean is, but uh, that we don't have that in the Marshalls. And so I began to kind of panic. I was like, we are way too close to this water. Like, this water is so close to us, and it's like at we're, we are at sea level, you know. And so... Uh, I began to do some research into it. And what I found what that really bothered me more than anything else was that most of the articles that were written about the Marshall Islands didn't actually discuss our perspective on the issue. Most of them just kind of assumed that we would pick up and leave. It was always like, where will these Marshallese people go? But never, what can we do to help these Marshallese people? What do these Marshallese people want, you know, as help? And, um... That we were always talked about and talked around, but we were never given a voice to speak. And so the poem that I wrote, it was all about, uh, first of all, highlighting the many intricate beauties of and complexities of our islands, of the beauty of our islands. And it ends with me basically saying we shouldn't have to leave and we don't want to leave. Because, you know, again, so many of those articles and so many of the perspectives abroad was just, well, they'll have to leave. There's nothing else to do. You know, and I don't think so. I don't agree with that. And I still don't agree with that. There is time for us to turn this around. Uh, and that's kind of a part of my work is just emphasizing that there is time, that we just need to be working together. Your your crusade, shall we say, <laughs> in, in climate change. I love the fact that you, you laugh because it's kind of related <laughs> to my question is like, how does it how does it make Kathy feel on the inside? Are you are you? If you get frustrated, are you angry? Are you just stoic and and dedicated? (laughs) Do you you find yourself having to, like, pick yourself up, pick your spirits up sometime? How does this fight affect you personally? Well, I am not stoic, first of all. I am a sensitive crybaby, for sure. And I think you kind of need to be sensitive to be a poet in a sense, right? You need to be in touch with your emotions. That's at least my argument. (laughs) I think, um, for me, it can get exhausting. You know, so many times... The work that I do is basically kind of bleeding myself open for people over and over. And then also this burden of representation everywhere I go. She represents the Marshall Islands. She represents Marshallese culture. That's not entirely true, right? Like I said, I grew up in the diaspora. I am not at all in any way an expert on Marshallese culture. I just happened, again, I happen to have a platform from where I can speak on this issue. And so that's what I'm using it for. But um, I think it's what really helps is that, you know, there are days when I I definitely get overwhelmed and there are days when I can't do it. And so what I need to do is just have downtime, you know, and my downtime is my daughter. 
uh, my downtime is Netflix, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you are human. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Superhuman. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, um, it's nice to know that, I mean, you're able to find that balance and being such a prominent representative. I know you said you're, you, you're not like the iconic yeah. like Marshallese, but, you know, uh, like you said, having this platform and being in the public eye, it's nice to know that you're able to find a balance. And yeah, it's difficult. I still don't, I'm not always fully balanced, but, you know, everyone's, I'll tr- I try, basically, yeah. <laughs> Well, our guest today is Kathy Jitnell Kitchener, a poet and climate change activist from the Marshall Islands. And we'll be back with more after this break. Hafa Day, this is Eulalia Villagomez of the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. Did you know that you can donate up to $5,000 to the Humanities Council through the CNMI Education Tax Credit Program? Donations from individuals and corporations qualify and can be used to offset your local wage and salary tax, BGRT, and earnings tax. Call our office at 235-4785 to see how you can support humanities programs in our community and obtain a tax credit for your donation. Thank you and see you Welcome back to Your Humanities Half Hour. We're speaking today with Kathy Jitno Kitchener, poet and climate change activist from the Marshall Islands. Now, you mentioned that you got your master's in, in California. By the way, what oh, was your... Oh, sorry. I got my bachelor's in California and my master's at UH Manoa. Okay, what were your degrees in? Uh, the first degree was in creative writing, and the second degree was in Pacific Island Studies. All right. Well, that probably explains what you're doing Um, now at the College of the Marshall Islands. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, I teach full-time as an instructor at the College of the Marshall Islands. Basically, I'm the Pacific Studies teacher. I teach issues in Pacific Studies, uh, contemporary social issues in Micronesia, and Pacific literature. And which of those classes would you feel is your favorite? (laughs) <laughs> That's tough. That's like making you choose your favorite Every child. child. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I like all of them for different reasons. It's a, I, I really like teaching. It's a fun, it's more, it's like more tangible, I think, than poetry and sometimes speaking abroad. It kind of brings you back down to earth like, okay, how do I break this issue down to make it interesting to these students who are, by the way, completely unimpressed by anything I've done, <laughs> which I appreciate, they're actually. They're like, educate us in an entertaining way. Yeah, That's they're like, we entertain me. Yes, <laughs> yes. Basically. By the way, how big are, is the average class size at the College of the Marshall Islands? Uh, 20, it caps at 20 or okay. 19 students. But yeah, I always over add, add a little bit more. So it's about 20 students per class. Now, aside from being a mom hmm. and an global activist and a professor, um, you had time to start a nonprofit kind of after your heart mm. in the Marshalls. Tell mm-hmm. us what that's about. So the nonprofit is super new. Um, it's called Jyotigum, uh, which basically means your home, but it's an acronym for the full name, which is, the full name is Jyotigum and Eogadung Maroro, meaning Youth for a Greener Marshall Islands. Um, yeah, bit of a mouthful. Yeah, and I'm <laughs> glad you said that, not me. <laughs> yeah, so it's a nonprofit that me and my cousin started a few years ago, and the idea is that we want to mobilize and empower Marshallese youth to f- seek solutions to environmental issues on our island, which includes climate change. Um, you know, part of the work that I did, you know, like like I said, having this platform really helps. Uh, but it, it makes me, it made me realize like it shouldn't be me, just me out there speaking on this issue. You know, there's so many other Marshallese kids who have different experiences and different backgrounds, and they need to be out here too. So that's kind of the purpose is we're trying to embolden and and empower these youth to be involved because. Uh, so far, there is no in, there is no organization that just targets youth and environmentalism, and that's what we're hoping this organization will do. What are some of the activities you guys are doing? Well, we just started a newest program. Uh, we just received a grant uh, to do some. It's we call it the Earth Champions program. So the idea is we have Earth cha- an Earth Champion, a youth that's selected from each of the villages on island. So there's seven of them total. And these Earth Champions, what they do is they undergo training, leadership training, um, and then they also go out into the community and facilitate conversations like a community meeting in which they would decide what kind of 
long-term project is most necessary for the community to support them uh, environmentally. Uh, and then after they do that, they will apply for grants from us, and then we, you know, approve it or help them edit it or whatever, and they carry out that project. Really short and simple. And the whole idea is, yes, they're coming up with solutions themselves, but they're also gaining some really practical skills like writing a grant, which not many people have right now. And then also carrying out this project so that they're involved in their community, so that we're not just promoting, you know, speaking at an international level, but we're promoting work on the ground. Yeah. Well, one of the ways that you're also um, encouraging other youth to become more actively involved in their community is, well, um, for example, the poetry workshop that you did here in Saipan a few mm -hmm, months mm -hmm, ago, mm -hmm. uh, using poetry as you have as mm -hmm. a, a platform for social change. Do you do this in many areas, and can you describe your workshop a little bit? Great question. I totally forgot to mention that. So our... So first, um, we came out here in Saipan, uh, me and a partner of mine from Pacific Resources for Education and Learning, PRO, um, and it was just to do like an initial workshop with the youth. Uh, and it, it was great. It was so great to see this turnout of so many, you know, youth from Saipan who are interested in writing and, sto and telling stories. And the what I like about these workshops is it's a chance where it's not just me just talking at the youth, you know. It's a chance for them to just kind of meditate and have this space to think about what is going on in their life and then share their, those stories that, you know, things that concern them, things that uh, excite them, things that worry them. Um, and so that is one of the workshops we did. But uh, this summer, Jyotigum also, we received a grant to do a one-week arts workshop out in uh, Medjero. And this was a one-week workshop where we brought in 30 high school students, and we spent an entire week teaching them how to write spoken word poetry and also mural, to create paint murals. Um, and this was all kind of related to climate, all related to climate change and waste, how waste and climate change are related. Yeah, because we have a huge waste problem in the Marshalls as well. And, you know, waste is totally linked to climate change. So that's what we were kind of having them see, that link. Yeah. And it was great. The, the products that came out of it was beautiful. These huge murals that were just gorgeous. And I've never seen anything like it. And it was completely done by these kids. And also the poetry was so fierce and raw. Um, the poetry that they shared, you know. So, uh, yeah, it was. that's kind of what I, I like and I really enjoy doing as well is this one-on-one -on -one workshop where we get to help these kids craft actual products. And that's something I hope to do again. Actually, I'm hoping to come back to Saipan to do it again, a one-week workshop. But we're still looking into it, yeah. I think you, the classroom at Northern Mariners College was actually full when you came to do the it workshop was, here. It was, yeah, yeah, there were a lot of high school students there. Yeah, they were great, yeah. I was, I was impressed, for sure, yeah. Now, you have a book coming out. Yes. Tell us about it. So the book is, uh, yep, it means, uh, sorry, the title of the book is Yep Jeldok Poems from a Marshallese Daughter. Um, it's a collection of poetry. Um, it includes all the poems that I have on YouTube, but also a lot of new pieces that I haven't shared. And it's published by University of Arizona Press Soundtrack Series. So they're a series uh, that publishes indigenous authors, and I think I'm the second Pacific Islander indigenous author. Um, it will be the first collection of, not just collection of poetry, it's the first book written entirely by a Marshallese outside of the Marshall Islands. I think, unless you count this other book that my uncle wrote, but he wrote that with someone else, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, you, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but either way, it's one of, it's the first collection of poetry, that's for sure. And yeah. when is it due? It's due in February. February, it's either 16th or 14th. Um, but I'm sharing it all on my social media pages. So if people follow me, I have a Facebook page, I have a Twitter. They just have to put in my name and they'd be able to find it. That's where I'll be announcing where they can buy it. But you can, you can actually begin pre-ordering it now at the University of Arizona Press uh, website. How do you feel about having this publication come out? Is this your first publication? It is. It's my first book. I'm stoked. Like, I'm super happy because, like, you know, I, it's not like I grew up thinking, I'm going to be a climate change activist. <laughs> I never thought of that. But I did want more than anything to publish a book, you Aww. know. And so this was a huge, monumentous occasion for me. I'm so happy about it. Yeah. And Yip Jeldok is, uh, the, the word Yip Jeldok, it was important to me that that word was in it. Yip Jeldok is a martial saying that uh, we say when a, a daughter is born. The idea is uh, it means uh, the basket facing the speaker, but we basically it basically means you're fortunate to have a daughter. 
because I, the concept is that women are seen as baskets full of offering. And it's mostly a nod to the fact that our culture is matrilineal. We pass our land down and trace our lineage through our mothers. Yeah, so I wanted to make sure that that name was in there. But yeah, I, I'm, just, I'm just happy, you know, and I can't wait to write another book. Yeah. Wow. Um, I think it's wonderful that you spent so many years outside the Marshalls, and yet the language is still very close to you, and you're very fluent in it. Well, you know, I'm not as fluent as I would like to be. Uh, I definitely am able to talk and talk story, but uh, I'm still learning, to be honest. You know, living out in the diaspora, you lose a lot. So, yeah, I'm, I'm learning as much as I can now, and I'm grateful for it. You're here in the Marianas this um, month to um, speak at the 25th anniversary of the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. And Mm. thank you again for coming back for that. How do you tie climate change with the humanities? What is the connection there? Well, what the connection to me is that in the climate movement, from what I have seen, there hasn't been enough of an emphasis on the arts and using the arts for raising awareness on climate change. It's always been science and numbers and facts. And I think that's super necessary, of course, don't get me wrong. That's so necessary. Uh, But for me, I think it's just as valuable and just as important to invest in in the arts, you know, and in promoting these kinds of issues because the arts puts a human face on it. It touches people, it touches their emotions, and that moves people more than just numbers and statistics. And I think that's the value of the performance that I did at the UN Climate Summit. It transformed the room from a room full of politicians into a room where, you know, we were connected to one another, where they were suddenly asking to hold my daughter and they wanted to tell me about their children, you know, and that's the power of art. And that's the power of humanities. You know, humanities isn't just art, of course, but it teaches us to think critically and to connect to one another. And that, to me, is incredibly important in climate change. That is why we're having this issue with climate change, because we don't we aren't connected to one another. We're like that is a faraway issue. That is their issue. And we need those connections now more than ever. And art facilitates that connection and humanities facilitates that connection. If you could give a word of advice to fellow Pacific Islanders, mm. uh, many of who are listening to our show, <laughs> what was it? What is it you would tell them? Oh, on advice on anything? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Whatever is closest or dearest to your heart is it? Is it the connections? Because of course, every every community, but we like to think our Pacific Island community. We're very much about family. We're very much about relationships. That's the way I explain it to visitors from outside who come. It's all about relationships when yeah, you come here. Yeah, yeah. What What do you feel is is our strength as a as a people that we should stand upon moving into? the future. I think we need to remember that we're not just a colonized people who have lost, you know, we're survivors. I mean, that's really what we are. We've survived hundreds and thousands of years, well, maybe thousands of years first on our own, and then hundreds of years of colonization, and then militarization on top of it. That's what I would definitely want us to remember, is that we are warriors. We are people who have survived, and we will continue surviving as long as we keep our links to one another, and as long as we keep our connections to one another. Well, our guest today has been Kathy Jitno Kitchener, poet and climate change activist. Kathy, any final words before we end today? No, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm so humbled and honored to be here on your island, and I hope to be back here again. Well, we certainly look forward to having you come back and maybe doing that art workshop. That sounds (laughs) like a lot of fun. I would love to, yeah. (laughs) This has been Your Humanities Half Hour. I'm Catherine Perry. This program was supported by a We the People grant awarded to the Northern Marianas Humanities Council from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities or the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. (laughs) 